Well, I'll get started. It's four o'clock here in Wisconsin. Good afternoon Sounds and good. welcome uh, to the USDA Midwest Collegiate Committee's first segment in our month of May Collegiate Series. My name is Tim and Corwin. I'm chair of the Midwest Collegiate Committee and I'm the general manager at Western Racquet Club in Elm Grove, Wisconsin. I hope everyone joining the webinar is doing well, is healthy, and is excited to get back on the tennis court as soon as possible. Throughout the webinar, if you have questions for the coaches, please use the chat box below at the bottom of your screen. And in the event that we don't get to your question, we'll uh, post an FAQ afterwards through the Midwest section office. All of us who have a passion for college tennis and those of you hoping to play college tennis can learn a ton from our two guests this afternoon. So we hope this segment on D1 recruiting during these times of uncertainty will be helpful. There are a lot of unknowns out there, but who better to talk to about those unknowns than two future Hall of Fame coaches from the Big Ten who perennially have their teams winning or competing for comp conference championships as well as deep runs in the NCAA championships. Today, we are proud to welcome Claire Pollard, women's tennis coach at Northwestern University. Claire is in her 22nd season at the helm. She boasts an incredible run of 11 consecutive Big Ten titles to her resume and 21 consecutive NCAA appearances. Alongside Claire, I should say below Claire, yeah, now alongside Claire, uh, we welcome Brad Dancer, men's tennis coach at the University of Illinois. Brad is in his uh, 16th season of leading the team. Brad's teams have been in the top three in the conference each year since he took over the reins, <coughs> including titles in 2012 and 2015, and 14 consecutive NCAA appearances, including an NCAA runner-up finish in 2007. Thank you both for joining us today. Uh, let's get started. Uh, these are our obviously very strange times. Uh, Claire, talk a little bit about on a personal level what life's been like for you the past couple of months. Um, well, I think initially when uh, this all went down, um, on the day um, the NCA decided to shut down college tennis, uh, we were, I was packed and ready. My bag was at the tennis center and we were headed to Florida to play the University of Virginia down at the USTA National Center. And, uh, you know, it was sort of a surreal moment when they said, hey, probably shouldn't go. And, you know, I think initially I thought, oh, a couple of weeks probably will shut down and maybe no flying initially. But I, in my wildest dreams, didn't think I would be sitting in my makeshift office, which is down in my basement right now, which is where I'm sitting. Um, you know, I, I've been on a ton of Zoom calls. I cannot think that Zoom is, is the greatest product there is right now. And I think we've all benefited immensely from that. Um, you know, I think the first couple of weeks, it's like when the season is over, I, I'm really tired and I'm really like kind of down and blur, blur. And uh, I think my kids felt that way when they didn't, school was canceled. So the, the only positive I can find out of all of this is I've gotten to see my own personal kids more in the last two months than I probably do um, on a regular time. And this time of year, they don't even know who I am typically. So that's been a real positive to have a lot of quality time with them. I think we're all enjoying a lot of family quality time. And um, I think probably my family's ready for a, a little bit less of it. Yeah, thank you, Claire. Brad, how about on your end? How are things out in Champaign? Yeah, we had a really unique situation for us. My wife and, and my four boys uh, flew down to Florida to see my folks for spring break uh, a day before the season got canceled. And so a couple of days after that, once we got everything situated in Champaign, I flew down, you know, with a couple of pairs of underwear and a pair of swim trunks. I thought I was going to be there for a couple of days. We ended up staying five weeks down in Florida. And uh, so that was time, again, like Claire referenced, just with the family time. My mom and dad don't get to see my children that much because uh, they're back and forth Michigan and Florida. So we really took advantage of that and, and just had some special time down there and, and, uh, and good weather down there when it wasn't so nice uh, back here in the Midwest. And then we've been home <clears throat> now about a week and a half. Uh, and it's, it's certainly different here. It's, you know, when you're in your, your home, uh, your home city and everything, there's, a, there's maybe a little bit more sobering and, and more real for us than, than when we were down in Florida. And so it's been that way. We're, we're, uh, 
you know, we're, we're getting together with friends at a social distance and trying to do that where we're doing the driveway barbecues and all those things. But uh, it's not the same as to, you know, I, I'm a little bit of a, of a hugger and so forth. So I'm used to run up to people and give them a big squeeze and something like that. And obviously it's it just, it's awkward and it's goofy. So, yeah. but uh, we're dealing with it like everybody else. Well, I'm glad you're both healthy. Uh, can you just speak for a minute? First you, Brad, and then, and then Claire, before I get to question two, uh, are your campuses closed? Like, can you get into your offices and can you, like, can you go into the weight room and lift? Uh, what, what amenities do you have on campus? What, what's life like on campus there? Yeah, at the current moment, everything is closed. So we don't have access to our offices, weight room, uh, any of those facilities. The original plan in Illinois was to keep some of those open for students that needed to come back. And I think when they felt like it was, it was so few students that were going to utilize those resources that they, they've shut everything down now at this point. Okay. Claire, same for you at Northwestern? Yeah, Western. we're exactly the same, yeah. yeah. Um, we have to get permission to go in our office. Ironically, I did go there for the first time since March 13th today. Um, there was just two books that I really wanted. Um, but other than that, yeah, absolutely everything's closed. They really don't want us around. Great, yeah. Well, hopefully that'll change soon. Uh, Brad, talk for a minute about your current players and how the pandemic COVID-19 has impacted their lives, their training, uh, their future, kind of a macro Reader's Digest version of what's happening with your players. Yeah, it's been different for, for every single guy, uh, you know, in terms of what access they have to facilities and courts and so forth and how much tennis are doing. For some of our guys, it's been a, an actually a, a great break for them physically. Maybe their bodies were at a point where they could use this break. Uh, other guys were maybe just hitting their stride and it's a really disappointing time for them in terms of, of where they are. I think the one thing that's come out of it, uh, and this took a while to, to take place, but maybe after three weeks or so and people started to see this was, was ongoing, I, I'd say the majority of our team right now has a part-time job. You know, either they're driving Uber Eats or Instacart or doing something, you know, stacking shelves at a grocery store. So that to me is maybe a little bit of good dose to reality for them of, of real world work. And, and uh, while they don't have a chance, you know, so I think they're doing fitness things and so forth, but I've been encouraged and so many of them have, have found a little opportunity to sort of get down in the bushes and get grinding a little bit. Awesome. Thanks, Brad. Claire, how about your girls? Um, well, they're, they're all home. Um, and it's very interesting at the different countries and different States, what the parameters are. Um, our Turkish young lady is in on lockdown most Thursdays through Sundays where she's not permitted to leave her house. And so, um, you know, she's on the extreme end. Um, my Irish player is only allowed to be within one kilometer of her home. So um, those of us who are over here feel like we have a ton of freedom, even if we're only supposed to go to the grocery store. Um, We've got a player from Georgia and she's had access to tennis courts since day one. She's been playing and um, she's probably the only one who's played consistently. Everyone else is kind of um, taking the longest break from tennis that they've ever taken in their lives. And uh, similar to Brad, I've really tried to sell them on it being a positive thing. I think um, sometimes in tennis, we're a little guilty thinking that volume is going to solve every problem. And, uh, you know, I've really tried to encourage the girls to look at this as, hey, I can really refresh my body, take a step back, really rejuvenate, and then, um, you know, come back maybe hungrier and more excited than ever. Oh, that's great advice. Uh, switching gears to the future and your, your recruiting, have, have you done much recruiting, Claire, during this time? And if so, what are, how has the COVID-19 impacted your recruiting practices and strategies? Um, you know, it's certainly been unique. Um, I was fortunate that I'm done recruiting through the 2021 season. So I, I'm really focused now on the 22 recruits. Um, and we're not allowed to talk to them until June 15th. Um, once that hits, I'm hoping that, you know, we can get some good conversations going um, and, and really delve into that. So I think I was really fortunate with the timing and the fact that, you know, I've been in touch a lot with my 20 commits and my 21 verbal commits. 
Um, still a lot of rules about what you can, and, and I kind of say the NCA is weekly changing what you are and not allowed to do. Um, so I, ha I actually am having a Zoom call once a week with my incoming freshmen and for the 2020 classes, so that's been really nice. And truthfully, I probably wouldn't be doing that with them right now or wouldn't have been doing that for the last couple of months. So from their point of view, they're probably getting a little bit more attention than they normally would have been getting right now. Um, so that's a positive, but uh, you know, we're really hoping the, the dead period gets lifted here. Um, it's through May 31st. I really think it's gonna get extended a little bit longer. Um, so right now, um, we're sort of hitting, um, I think it's just going to slow everything down for the 22s. Uh, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's going to be a real positive thing for everyone. We all probably are rushing some of this process that doesn't need to be rushed because in the end, making a good decision is what's really important for both the players and the coaches. Excellent. Thank you, Claire. Brad, how, what's your situation like this time of year? Sort of, sort of the opposite of Claire. I'd love to trade places with her and say we were all done with everything. But, uh, you know, I think we're still looking to potentially add for the, for the current year, the 2020 year. Um, and then we're, you know, really strong in terms of 2021 at the moment, uh, working on that. So uh, we feel like we've, you know, we, we've been talking about it every day that, you know, come June 15th, we've got to be full, bo full, uh, full go at 2022. So we got all those things we're managing. And then at the same time, uh, you know, the roster situation, we got a number of our seniors that are going to come back. Everybody gets extended another year of eligibility. And when you put that to an equivalency equation like we have on the men's side, it gets a little bit tricky in terms of how we're going to manage that. And so I think that uh, the coming four years will be really interesting on the men's side to see who's able to navigate, uh, you know, this equivalency aspect of it retention of current players, you know, and then, and then transfers and what's going to happen with transfers. So it'll be really, really interesting. It's a challenge, no question. And uh, we're going to all have to stay uh, on our toes, I think. Yeah, two questions that came out of your responses, just to educate those who are listening in and watching. Um, maybe you could just uh, educate what a dead period is. And then, um, Brad, you were saying, the equivalency so you have seniors and now you're having to figure out how to how to slice up the pie a little finer um, if you could just walk that back and, and talk for a minute about what the what a dead period is and then uh, how many scholarships you have and and how you uh, you know year in and year out have to slice that pie yeah, I'll, I'll use a couple of the quick examples where, um, so first the dead period is just a time in recruiting where uh, the coaching staffs cannot be off campus recruiting any evaluation or contacts or prospects, nor can they have any campus visits come onto the campus, unofficial or official. So typically it's only four days a year in the fall during the signing period for us, but now it's been extended, as Claire said, up till June 1st. And I, and I agree with Claire, I think they'll be probably extended another month uh, going forward here. Uh, and then as you look at, uh, you know, how if you take a, a player on our team, Alex Brown, who's a junior All-American this year, next year he's supposed to be a senior. Uh, so we've got funds allocated for him. We're recruiting the 2021 class based on, you know, funds that, that, uh, that he's going to be, you know, looping out of that cycle and be gone. Well, he's already indicated to us he'd love to come back for a fifth year and, and possibly play and work on his master's program at that time. So now in terms of how we offer 2021, it depends a little bit on, we'd also love to have an All-American back for his fifth year. And so those are some of the, the challenges that, that all the coaches at all the programs are gonna face. Perfect, yeah, that's very helpful. Claire, on the women's side uh, at, at Northwestern, do you have eight full scholarships? And so if a senior decides to stay, could they stay? How would that work for you? And, and how did Northwestern uh, handle the the seniors are they allowed and would you want it to happen and what's your what's the scenario there well everyone's got an unlimited scholarship fund next year so any any program men's or women's can go as high as you want on scholarships next year providing it's a returning player on your own team you cannot bring anyone in from the outside and and go over your eight for us eight or for Brad 4.5 so you can't transfer someone in 
and go ab above and beyond the limit. But if they're a returning player, like our senior is going to return, but we'd already offered her scholarship. So next year, we're going to have nine players on scholarship. And that's totally allowed. Going forward, once this class is grandfathered out, you, you can retain your juniors and your sophomores and your freshmen for an additional year, but you have to stay at the regular amount of scholarship. Very helpful. So we have some yeah. difficult yeah. decisions. I mean, I think, you know, Brad's decision with a junior who's an All-American is a little bit easier, but I think the NCA has put us coaches in quite a tricky predicament going forward when we got a balance. And, you know, I, I've tried to talk to my younger players about this is a long way off. And you might think right now the idea of five years is really awesome, but five years is a long time. And, and the commitment that we're asking is really high. And this isn't so, sort of something that I think players are going to take lightly and coaches are not going to take lightly. So, um, you know, they're going to have to convince us they're going to be all in. And um, we're going to also have to convince them that we're all in on them. Yeah. Great answers, guys. Um, moving along, like you're in different spots with the recruiting, as you mentioned earlier. What, what advice, not just for D1, but just in general, do you have for high school students right now in terms of, getting noticed, getting recruited to play in college, not just for elite programs like Northwestern or Illinois, uh, but for college tennis in general, like what, how will players get your attention or how will you find players? I'll start with Brad and then, and then Claire. That's a great question. I, I think that one of the things that will happen, my guess is as soon as we're allowed to host tournaments, you know, and facilities are open back up, uh, I'd be very surprised if you don't see people cre creating open events to to allow an influx of players to come in. And and so that may be a USTA event or, or a non-USTA event, such as a UTR event, offering some prize money. I know that that's one of the things we're looking at at the moment is trying to create some open events just to allow some competition to happen. So I think that, that uh, prospects need to be able to look out for those types of tournaments. And then the one thing that I would say in terms of advice is, you know, you got to control the things that you can control. And right now you can't really work on your competing, but you can work a lot on serves. You can work a lot on technique. You can work a lot on fitness and, and, you know, strength and so forth. So I'd say really work on controlling the things you can control at the moment. Thank you, Brad. Claire, anything to add there? Yeah, I think, um, I think patience is going to just be really important. Um, as I alluded to earlier, the recruiting process has been sped up and everyone seems in a hurry. And uh, I think if we learn, learn anything from this situation that we're all in is that, you know, slowing down and maybe taking our time and um, at any moment, look at it, it got taken away from all of us very, very quickly. And, um, you know, we've all had a lot of time to reflect and, and I think, I think players don't need to be anxious. I think they're going to get recruited. Uh, uh, we're going to get out there. We're going to get back on the road. We're going to get back to watching players. I think the one thing that a young player could be doing right now is if it's permissible to have contact with the coaches, they should be really reaching out because as I alluded to earlier, normally right now, you know, Brad and I would be totally entrenched in the season and we'd just be so focused right now on our current team that recruiting would be, it's always a priority, but it would probably be, a little bit lower and right now we're not allowed to work with our players so what you can do on the computer reading emails corresponding I, I would just encourage players to reach out just communication is just going to be really important over the next few months then telling us where they're going to be what they're going to be doing and uh, as Brad said there's going to be a lot of pop-up things that we're all going to have to be on our toes ready to go go and watch players playing thank you Claire Claire what uh, what's your philosophy with videos, um, coaches recommendations, UTR, like how do you, how do you sort through the different ways that, uh, given that you can't watch players compete right now, um, let's say you, you were to receive a video now, is that more relevant to you in this time than it would be when you can go out and watch players play or, 
you know, what's your sense on videos? I think it really varies program to program. Um, I, I don't want to speak for everyone. I mean, some people have an amazing recruiting budget. Some people are recruiting just as what we're doing right now. They're looking at a computer screen and that's how they recruit and they do it exceptionally well. I mean, there's, there's a lot of good um, information. Obviously the internet has opened our whole world into such a different place. Um, you know, if I saw a video, what I would like to see from a player right now is just, um, just showing me that they're doing something like Brad said, what can, what can you be doing right now to be getting better? There are things that you could be doing. And so if a player was sort of sending me stuff and sort of alluding to all the things that they were trying to accomplish that, that would, that would excite me more from the commitment point of view than actually an evaluation piece. I, I don't particularly like video from an evaluation point of view. Um, it's a starting place. I think, you know, UTR is a starting place. Results are a starting place. Um, for me, I really like to get to know the player. Who am I going to be working with? What are you all about? And, and we're very upfront as to what we're all about at Northwestern because, uh, I've learned over the years I'm not for everyone and, and I'm totally okay with that. Very good. Thank you. Brad, what's your, uh, how do you put all those uh, elements into this recruiting soup? I, I got to be honest. I don't know if I could say anything different than what Claire just said. She said it perfectly. You know, you, you look at all these things that are starting points and, and, and a place to, you know, to begin. And the reality is, is, you know, for us, a big part of it is that visiting campus and being around our team. And, and does the team feel comfortable with them? They feel comfortable with the team. And you can, you can tell when it's the right mesh. Uh, and also player to coach. you got to have that confidence in one another that, that that's the right fit. So I think Claire said everything perfectly. Excellent. Maybe, uh, Tim, I'll jump in on that a little bit. What, how about dealing with parents compared to dealing with the players on the recruiting side? Yeah, I think that's something, and Claire can probably speak, even better than I can on this. But for me, over the last 10 years, that's one of the changes. I think the parents are more involved uh, in the recruiting process. They're more involved while the players are current student athletes. And, uh, and I think I just, there's a lot more co uh, correspondence and communication that I have with parents uh, just throughout the whole timeline, recruiting and, and uh, during their time in Illinois. Um, piggybacking off that, I mean, I have had to tell parents sometimes that I only had one scholarship and that I wasn't going to be able to take them as well as the player. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I feel like they've got a kick out of that and enjoyed that when I've said that. Look, um, you know, the world is very different. I, I take the parental piece very seriously. I'm now a parent. Um, you know, I, I don't, my, do my daughter is not going to go and play college. Um, tennis, but if she was, it would be really important to me to know who was going, who was I going to entrust my daughter or my son with? And so I feel like as a, as a coach and as a parent myself, I understand the parents' involvement in trying to understand who they're entrusting their daughter and son with. And I take that incredibly seriously and respect that. I just think there's a line that they need to, need to, you know, find from their point of view, they should be looking at it very differently. But when I ask the player a question and the parent answers for them, I, I, I have a little bit of a concern with that. So I think as a parent, you, you totally have a lot of right to look into it. You should, you absolutely should know what your daughter and son is getting involved in, but you also need to understand that it's the player that we're recruiting. Very fair, good answers guys. Good question, Chad. Uh, Claire, what qualities, like you, you mentioned earlier, I'm not for everybody. Uh, are there certain qualities in a player that you're looking for that you know mesh well with your personality and your coaching style? Gosh, if I knew the answer to that, I, I might, <laughs> I'd be a lot better coach. Um, I gotta say, and I've spent endless hours on it. Um, I've researched everyone who's ever played for me and I've asked myself, gosh, which ones worked out better than others? What did they have in common? And I can't find any common denominators. I wish I could because, you know, but I, I take a lot of um, solace in knowing that, you know, Tom Brady was a six round pick in the 
NFL. So I, I feel like it, it's not it's not an exact science. Um, I think love of the game. Um, I, I recently heard someone say, wow, I didn't know how much Claire was into tennis. And I was like, whoa, hold on a minute. You know, like you got to be into tennis if you come. I think, and I think that's true for most programs now. I think we're very, pa I'm very passionate about the game of tennis. I, I just, I'm, I'm just so grateful what it's done for my life. And I think it is just such a great tool to learn about yourself. It's by far the hardest job anyone will have in their lifetime is, is playing college tennis if they want to be at the really high level and they're really going to commit to, to the student part of the process, it's by far the hardest job. Um, so you got to be ready to work. Um, other than that, you know, I, I, like, I like lots of different players. I like lots of different people. I like having a lot of variety on my team. I don't like the same. I, I don't want someone who's necessarily the same as me. I, I, I like challenge. And I, I certainly have recruited a lot of challenging kids over my years. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Claire. Brad, what, what about your philosophy on players? It's so tricky. I mean, you, you just listen to Claire and you can see, you know, probably why she's had success. You can see she's able to, to get in and, and connect probably individually with people. So that's why she can't find that common denominator. And I'm not certainly not comparing myself anywhere near Claire because she's a legend and so forth. But I do feel like one of my strengths is is connecting individually uh, with our with our student athletes, and so the, the big things for me that, that if you're going to put some generalities on it, number one, they they have to be able to make it academically at Illinois. You know, I mean, the Northwestern's obviously no different. It's not they're not easy places to to come and and go to college. And then after that, she hit the next thing on the head, which is you know, do they love to compete? Do they love to play tennis and so forth? How do they handle adversity? I think that's another huge one is, is you've got to have people that are resilient, that are tough, that, that don't mind being kicked in the head a little bit, whether it's practice or, or competition. Um, and then the other thing is if they played team sports, you know, is this someone that's, that's been a team captain? You know, are they someone that's got some leadership skills to them, uh, you know, when, they, when they're on other teams and what has been their role on Little League Baseball or Pee Wee Football or what it may not be, but uh, that was one of the things, you know, Tim Kopinski, one of our great players from Chicago, and, and he was a great, he was captain of his hockey team. And he didn't say a word, you know, he was, everybody thought he's quiet Tim, but he was captain of his hockey team. So, you know, that told me a little bit about like how he saw himself out there and how others saw him as well. That's, that's awesome. Claire, you said like being a college D1 student athlete could be the toughest job that you ever have. Just thinking about that, what, type of commitment does being a D1 student athlete at Northwestern and, and U of I require? Is, is it 12 months a year? Uh, and if yes, uh, how do your players balance school and tennis and social life and still li live a healthy life lifestyle? Um, you know, for me, if you love the game and you love what you're doing, it's just part of who you are. Um, I don't think I've given much sacrifice in my life to, to have been a great player or a great coach. It's just, it's just what I do and I love. And what's really, you know, great about our job is that we can sort of incorporate our families a little bit into our life. So that's been really nice. Um, you know, we have a lot of team dinners and so the team's over and, you know, my family can be there. It's not a night I have to be away from them. And I think that's been really good in order to find that because, you know, it certainly is, it's a lifestyle. It's not really a job. It's just sort of what you do. Sometimes if you've got to call Turkey, you might have to stay up till midnight or one in the morning to make that phone call. Or, you know, you might have to get up at 5 a.m. to reach someone. So it's, it's sort of a lifestyle. But, um, you know, it, it's changed. I mean, um, I played more matches in the summer than I did during my college season when I played and we played when there was unlimited dates, but we just played, you know, we just always wanted to play. The players are a little different now. They, they seem to need a little bit of a break from it. Um, so it can be 12 months. It can be nine months. It can be 10 months. I, for me, it's always about a purpose and a reason as to why if a player walks into me and says, coach, I just gave me, I just gave you all I had for the last eight months. I'm going to take a little bit of a break now. I'm going to reset myself. I'm going to take care of my body. 
you know, there's a couple of things I'd like to do. I, I love that. I love that approach. I just like a plan. I just like to understand where they're coming from and what they do. Um, it's certainly it's certainly a juggling act, but I think life's a ju juggling act. Um, but I think we're really paying attention to the health and welfare of our players. Um, I think, you know, coaches that do a good job, know their players, they know what they need. They know when they need an extra day off. They know when they need a little bit extra TLC. And I, I think that's really important to understand your players. That's great. Thank you, Claire. Brad, do you think college athletes can have it all? Can you have uh, active social life, do amazing in school and dominate on the courts? I think you can. It takes a, it takes a special person to be exceptional in all those areas. You know, you see a lot of the young men that we coach, they're, they're exceptional in two of the areas. And then, you know, a third one might, might uh, flounder a little bit, but um, I think it's possible. I, I do. You know, the, you can hear Claire, there, there's so much where I think the coaches and the team, your teammates have a lot to do with that as well. You know, if they're pushing you and driving you and, and, and even socially, if they're, they're driving, I think Kevin Anderson is a great example when he was here and his social life was, was nil when he got here. But then, you know, as the years went on, you know, he was, he went out with the guys and he had fun with the guys and he, and he made it a good time. So there's a guy that, you know, that was hitting all three of those things, you know, no problem. And so, I think it just sometimes it's it's the, it's the time period that they're in. There's a lot of maturation and emotional growth that goes on from 18 to 22. And so a little bit depends on where each person is during that time as well. That's great. Thank you both. Uh, just a couple questions. Uh, and then if we have some time, we'll look at the chat and the Q&A. Um, these come from Paul McDonald. You know, you both know him well. Uh, and I'm just going to throw them out there. Brad, you go first and then Claire. Uh, let's say I'm a player. I, um, what options should I explore if I'm not good enough for Northwestern or Illinois? And when I'm exploring those options, what factors do you think are important? Coach, team chemistry, uh, university, uh, size of the school, et cetera. And then it's all part of the same question. Um, should I pick a school where I'm going to be in the top six as a freshman or uh, is it, does it make sense to go to a school where I might, you know, be able to, you know, be patient and work on my game and, and develop as a, as a, as a person on and off the court. That's There's a, a lot. lot to the question. There's a lot to that question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll start. What about players that, uh, you think, well, you may not be strong enough for my program. What advice do you give? Because you're, you're getting a lot of recruits that, um, you know, are contacting you and they may just not be the right fit or at the right level. Couple things. Number one, I think to me, there's, there should be a, um, there should be a, an attraction, mutual attraction between the student athlete and, and the coaches that are recruiting them. And so I, one of the first things I say is the school you want to go to is probably a school that's recruiting you. You know, that's, that's somebody that wants you and values you and treasures you. And, and, and you want to go to, to, a, to a university such as that. And then in terms of, you know, if it, if it's the school that they want, that doesn't, you, you mentioned Northwestern or Illinois, and, and maybe they don't fit in those programs. Then you start looking at all the variables that you talked about. You know, what is, what is the campus like? What are the number of students there? Is this person going to fit in at a, at a big campus or a smaller campus? You know, what's, you know, is it going to be a city or is it going to be a small town? Those things. And then I really feel like depending on where tennis fits into their life, if it is going to be a, a significant portion of their university life, then the teammates and the coach are, are huge, huge variables and decided, in my opinion. That's great. Thank you, Brad. Claire, you're recruiting somebody and they say, coach, and, and there is that mutual attraction that, that Brad describes. And they say, can you guarantee me that I'm going to be playing in the top six? I mean, is that a red flag? Like, do you discount that? Or do you think of that as, hey, this person's competitive. She wants to play in the top six. Is that just a maturity thing on their part? And you know that once they're there, they'll realize that whether they're in the top six or not, they're going to play a lot anyway. I don't, 
don't think it's a, it's not a invalid question. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly something that I will answer no to, no to easily. Um, I will have no difficulty telling them that nothing is guaranteed. Um, but I think it, there's some positives that I can look into that question. I would be grateful that they actually asked me a question. Yeah. Uh, and that they were like, you know, had some insight and, and it would lead to some good conversation as to perhaps why are they asking that question? You know, and, and the competitive piece of whether you, sh you know, you want to aspire to get in a lineup, you want a bit more security knowing you're in the lineup or whether you want to play, you know, number one, there, there's pros and cons to all of that. And I think it's up to each individual to sort of figure that out. But what you think you want at 16, can be very different by 17, by 20, and uh, you know, by 22, you're a totally different person. That's, that's great. Great answers, both of you. So we're winding down. I, uh, this, this is a, maybe a little bit open-ended question for Claire. Uh, the future of college tennis over the next three to six months as you're looking at the landscape and participating in Zooms and ITA committees and uh, campus stuff with other coaches at, at Northwestern. What, as it relates to women's tennis for the fall, do you envision, uh, are you planning four to seven dates of individual tournaments uh, like you would in a typical fall or is everything on hold? What, uh, where do you see things right now? Um, it's tricky. Um, I don't have a crystal ball and, and I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to weigh up all the pros and cons and all the different scenarios that might be this fall. I, I, I'm really optimistic that there's going to be full tennis. Um, I'm very optimistic that, uh, you know, college athletics is going to, it's going to look different, but it's still going to be equally impactful and equally exciting and beneficial to the players and anyone who's fortunate enough to be doing it. Um, you know, I, I, cost is definitely, budgets are definitely being talked about a lot. And, and I think as a sport that is really luxuriously enjoying nine months of competition, we should look very carefully at our full season and perhaps we can tweak that a little bit, maybe cut a little bit of cost without compromising the competitive piece, which I think we all pride ourselves on providing for the student athletes. Um, you know, I, I hope that we can navigate it successfully. Um, again, how I feel about it today, the NCA is going to come out with stuff in a couple of weeks and I might have a totally different spin on it, unfortunately. And I don't mean to be wishy-washy. It's just, you know, it, it is where that is right now. Um, I think I'm looking at, you know, delaying my full season a little bit more. Um, we've never played seven individual events. Um, we try to use more team dates where it's 25, you know, period, the end, each player can play 25. So however you count it. Um, and I think to be honest, the thing that we're really selling when you come to college is the team portion of the season. That's what I think players just really thrive and look forward to. So dedicating as many dates to that is, I think is where my priority is. Yeah. Great answer. Brad, where, where, uh, where do you see things and how are you kind of planning for the fall? Yeah, for, for us, I, I kind of agree with Claire. We're, we're moving forward, uh, you know, with sort of our, our normal fall routine, if you will, but very clearly we're ready to adapt and, and make some adjustments. And so I've been on the phone with a number of coaches regionally about what types of tournaments we might structure, uh, you know, should some, some national events go away in the fall. So I think we're just sort of, waiting, waiting, waiting for more official word to, to come out of it and then be ready to, to make some adjustments to the fall schedule and then even potentially into the spring. So I personally have enjoyed the way that, that our administration has handled it. They've said, hey, there's, there's likely to be changes coming. Uh, we're not going to make any yet. You know, keep doing this, but be ready to adapt and adjust as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good answer, both of you. Where should the viewers, participants, we've got some student athletes, I'm sure, that are watching what's the most reliable source for them to find what, where should they go for the most accurate information? Cause there's a lot of misinformation out there. Either of you, NCAA website or 
what's your uh I'm looking up into my right corner at Claire. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think the NCA, um, I don't know if all the information is published to everyone. Um, you know, I think, um, I think Zoo Tennis does a good job of, of really following and keeping up to date with what's going on on, on college tennis. Um, I think the ITA website, We Are College Tennis, can be helpful. Um, and again, I think... Um, yeah, I think those three websites would be something that I would look at, but I just would be very cognizant of it's very rapidly changing. And so what you might hear this week, don't think it, you know, it's not necessarily being contradicted. It's just being adapted as the situation is ever evolving. Thank you. Another thing I would point out on top of that with Claire, what she said earlier is I would encourage any prospect to ask questions to, you know, to reach out to us, email, call, uh, Coaches like to talk to recruits. They like to, to have that relationship and that engagement. Perfect. That kind of goes along. There's a Q and A there, Tim. You want to touch on those? Yeah. Well, there's a question. Yeah, I will there. for sure. Um, the first one is a question for Coach Pollard. Uh, my name is Camilla Wong, and I am from Palo Alto. My question is: Since I am interested in playing tennis for university, but I am from California, what do I need to do? to get the exposure needed since you and your coaches cannot watch me play at a national tournament and events uh, since they are suspended or canceled. So is, is the answer, send me a, send me an email and, and tell me your UTR or Claire, do you want to answer Camilla? Well, I, I'm just going to answer in a general forum that I think you just sit tight. You sit tight. There'll, there'll be tournaments, you know, um, decisions right now. Clay courts is still on. Hard courts is still on. Um, I'm not sure that they'll, they'll be on in a week's time or in two weeks time, as I said, but I would just sit tight and, and, and be patient because I think that's what this situation is calling for from all of us to be. Um, I don't think coaches are just going to, offer scholarships just based on a ranking without having really done their homework on a player. They're going to, they're going to want to go out and see the players. They're going to want to spend the time getting to know them. So I, I would just be patient and sit tight and uh, you know, it might not happen quite as quickly as we all have, have been used to in the last few years, but it, it's going to happen for everyone. Great. Thanks coach. Uh, next question. Uh, if this spring, my junior year was the year I was hoping to break out, and now the season is canceled. What can I do to get on coach's radar with no season to film our wins uh, and without a record? I think this question probably comes from a, a high school player whose high school season has been canceled. Um, so same kind of answer, Claire and Brad, just be patient, get out and play some USGA tournaments since you're only a junior um, when those come back online. I think no, no question. Claire's right. It's the one thing that this has taught all of us is to, is to slow down just a little bit. Uh, as she mentioned, the recruiting process has just gone earlier and earlier, you know, over the last few years. And so uh, this is maybe a, a cycle where it, it slows down again and comes closer to how it was 10, 15 years ago. And I think a lot of coaches will tell you that, that having more time to evaluate and, and more time for the prospects to evaluate the schools probably is not a bad thing. That's, that's great. Thank you both very much. Really good answers. Andrew Meyer sent one in, which is uh, related to the June 15th. He's class of 2022, um, you know, advice on building relationship with coaches to attain his D1 goal. Um, just send coaches that you're interested in an email and, and begin that uh, relationship via email. Is that pretty much where you guys, that's what I've heard you guys say today. If there's no rush, 2022, that's a ways off. Um, and reach out to the coaches where you think you might be a good fit. Yeah, knowing that we can't do anything with the 2022 until after June 15th. So you, the only thing that I always respond back is, you know, <laughs> thank you for letting me know. NCA rules prevent me from responding to this email until June 15th. Look forward to talking to you then. 
And it's not just, I'm not, I, I, no coach is blowing someone off. They're just following the rules. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Yep. Um, there are a couple out of the chat and then I actually, I think we're, let's see here. Um, with the economic impact of the pandemic to colleges and universities, how will this impact D1 tennis programs? with the absence of national tournaments, what vehicle will coaches use to recruit rising juniors? Um, I think that was just answered. This is from Jose uh, Hernandez or Joe Hernandez to all panelists um, that it looks, well, as of now, the Clays and uh, Kalamazoo and San Diego are still on the schedule. Um, and so I think we don't know yet, but hopefully your players could play in those tournaments and, and get in front of coaches there. Um, what advice can you share for players to help them in the recruitment process during the current environment? How do they engage with programs given national tournaments are going to be canceled? So really just communicate after June 15th, the extent to the extent that the coaches uh, throughout the country can communicate back after June 15th. And I would just say that I don't see coaches um, skimping on recruiting dollars. I think where if, if, if we have to sort of make adjustments with budgets, I think competitive season will not be compromised and I don't think recruiting will be compromised. I, I think that those are two bigger investments that we're making. We're making a tremendous investment in a young person um, scholarship wise, commitment wise, all the resources we're going to give them that we're not going to skimp on that and, and rush that. So it's just a matter of being patient. I hate to keep preaching the same thing, but I just, I mean, our hands are tied right now. No, I appreciate that. You guys have been incredibly open and, and forthright and just very honest and personal in your response has been awesome. Where would the student athletes go to find the recruiting rules in general? Is there a uh, um, NCAA link that uh, you often refer potential student athletes to? Um, Chad, you may know the answer to that as well, but uh, just curious if, if there's a uh, direction that we can give the, the viewers on, on the recruiting rules so that they would know it, that it was June 15th that the dead period would end June 15th or you'd be pushed further out. Chad, do you want to take that? Yeah, we usually send everybody to the NCAA Eligibility Center and um, have them go through the guide to, to, uh, to college sports. And we could also send that link out to everybody afterwards um, so that you can have the direct link to get that information as well. Awesome. Well, I want to thank uh, Tara, who's not pictured. She's uh, the USTA Midwest marketing guru. Uh, outstanding job, Tara, on getting the word out about the, the webinar with coaches Claire and Brad and Chad. You continue to do an amazing job for the section and really promoting college tennis. Um, and to our panelists, thank you both so much for your time and uh, energy. And uh, it was really a privilege for me to talk with you guys today and share uh, some Q&A with the audience. So with that, um, I wish everybody a great day and healthy, uh, healthy days ahead. And uh, all the best for, for college tennis. Um, one last word that we, uh, we the, the second uh, webinar in the series will be D2, 3, and NAIA. And we're also adding a junior college coach as well to the panel for next Friday. And uh, we look forward to um, having you join us again next week. Claire, Brad, thank you both so very much and uh, all the best. Thank you all. Sam and Chad, thank you so much. Take care. Take care, everybody.